Undisclosed Location, Mountains of Italy, September 9th, 1943. The German gliders come in, circling to get an idea of the terrain before they attempt a landing. In each are German paratroopers and SS commandos about to embark on an audacious raid. Below them, they see the remote hotel, high on a plateau, accessed usually only by a funicular railway and a small airstrip. It's similar to what they saw in the aerial photos. Except, wait a minute, that isn't an airstrip. It's a ski run. The gliders hit it in a jostling, violent landing. A few men take injuries, but then they're out. They wave guns at the Italian troops pouring out of the hotel, telling them to lay down their arms, and the Italians comply. Then, an SS officer goes inside to find their target, Benito Mussolini, imprisoned here after being deposed in a coup. Germany wants Mussolini in Rome, at the head of its new puppet state. Because in the south, the Allies have landed at Salerno. This extra, extra history episode is brought to you by the good folks over at Company of Heroes 3, an awesome new entry into the COH franchise that directly ties into this week's historical tale, available as of today via the link below. When we talk about D-Day, we're often referring to the Normandy landings of Operation Overlord, but that's not entirely accurate. The term D-Day refers to any amphibious landing, and contrary to popular belief, the Normandy landings were not even the first toehold the Allies got in Europe. Yet the Italian campaign has never gotten the attention it deserved, with veterans sometimes referring to themselves as veterans of the forgotten D-Day. By mid-1943, the Allies were finally in a position to begin liberating Europe. On the Eastern Front, the Soviets had turned Hitler's Operation Barbarossa into a grinding stalemate that increasingly looked like it would end in German defeat. In North Africa, American and British Commonwealth forces had defeated the Africa Corps, not only giving the green American troops valuable combat experience, but also giving the commanders a chance to try, at least, to work together. But that relationship started getting rocky pretty quick. Coalition warfare is always difficult and political, and it really wasn't helped by the fact that this generation of British and American leaders, from Roosevelt to Churchill to Patton and Montgomery, had quite the big egos. The first conflict came over where in Europe to attack. Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight Eisenhower favored landing on the French coast, then driving through the Netherlands, Belgium, and into Germany. Basically, the plan that would later be used after the Normandy landing in 1944, and he didn't want anything siphoning men and material from that effort. Churchill, however, advocated a different strategy. They would land in Italy and cut deep into what he called the soft white underbelly of the Reich. You see, Italy had not been as committed to the war as Germany had been. Mussolini was never able to totally subsume Italy's conservatives in the same way Hitler had, meaning his power base was much less secure. There was a lot of ill feeling about the war, which many Italians saw themselves as fighting on Germany's behalf rather than for their own interests. Conversely, Italians tended to have positive feelings towards British and Americans. Many aristocratic Italians had studied in the UK, and large-scale immigration to the US meant many in Italy actually had family in the United States or even aspired to become Americans themselves. The country was also the first to start violating treaties and rearming after World War I, meaning much of their military equipment was now antiquated. Attack Italy, Churchill argued, and they could knock it out of the war. Though he didn't want to be sucked into a quagmire, Eisenhower reluctantly agreed, provided that the Italian operation remained limited in scope and only in exchange for greater British participation in the Pacific. But before any Italian invasion, they would need to take Sicily. At first, it seemed like it might be simple. Italian troops surrendered during the landing, with some even defecting and helping allies unload their transports. But then came the command issues. American General George Patton handled one side of Sicily, while British General Bernard Montgomery handled the other. And these two were not compatible. Montgomery was a talented general whose troops loved him, but his eccentricity, upper-class mannerisms, and perceived arrogance rubbed Patton the wrong way. Meanwhile, Patton, well, Patton was sort of all of that, plus being rough and tumble. Though a brilliant commander and popular with troops, he had a tendency towards interpersonal conflicts and made enemies everywhere he was posted. Seriously, Rob's great-grandfather actually served with Patton in Hawaii, and they hated each other. He even insulted Rob's great-grandmother at a party once, which is just bonkers to me. Also, sorry, great-grandma Rob. 
Inevitably, splitting up the island fostered a rivalry between the British and American commanders right when everyone was supposed to be coming together. Patton also got into some political trouble when he visited a field hospital and met with a soldier who wasn't physically injured, but rather suffering from severe mental trauma from combat. Patton berated the man and slapped him repeatedly, causing a media firestorm back home that almost got him fired. Other expensive lessons were learned, like when British gliders were dropped too far out to sea, drowning 250 soldiers. Yet still, the invasion of Sicily was a success. In fact, it proved such a blow against Italian morale that a royalist coup forced Mussolini from power, with the provisional government imprisoning the former dictator in a remote hotel, as we saw in this episode's opening. And while the Italian government pretended to still be a solid German ally, they also began secretly reaching out to negotiate a surrender with the Allies. If Allied troops landed, they said, Italy would surrender. And suspecting this was the case, Germany moved in, effectively occupying Rome and northern Italy as a rallying point for hardcore Italian fascists. But given that Italy teetered on the brink of surrender, Eisenhower wanted to invade immediately. But where to land? The answer was Salerno. Across from Sicily, it was just inside the range of Allied air cover. And while most of the Italian coast was too rocky to land on, the port of Salerno had a stretch of beach. Even better, it had good connection to road networks and a small airfield. Eisenhower called his plan Operation Avalanche, a landing in force at Salerno, followed by a fight up the peninsula to secure Naples. Montgomery would lead a major diversionary attack in Calabria, a thing he insisted would not work, to draw away German troops. There was also plans to drop the 82nd Airborne outside of Naples and Rome, hoping it would link up with the partisans and take the cities, but those operations were thankfully scrapped as suicidal. Heading up the operation moving forward would be American General Mark Clark, a man who perhaps was not the best choice, because anyone commanding a coalition has to be part politician, and Clark would struggle with diplomacy, despite the fact that forces under his command were from all over. The American 36th Infantry Division was a Texas National Guard unit, and Montgomery's 8th Army had units from Australia, New Zealand, and specific areas of the UK. Now that meant that casualties would fall heavily on these places back home, which could trigger political pressure on the British if, for example, Australian troops perceived themselves as always getting the most dangerous and costly assignments. For the Germans' part, Hitler was unsure if he should defend Italy at all. In fact, Erwin Rommel advised pulling troops to the far north, whereas Field Marshal Albert Kesselring claimed that he could make a fight of it. After all, Italy is rough terrain, mountainous and cut with rivers, with soil so rocky you can't often dig foxholes. He could hold the mountain passes and bleed the Allies. Hitler sided with Kesselring and put him in charge of defending Italy. September 9th, 1943, off Salerno. In the troop ships, Allied soldiers are cheering. Word has just come through that due to Montgomery's diversionary landing at Calabria and another at Taranto six days before, the Italian government has officially surrendered. They start talking. Will the landings be unopposed? Is this going to be a walkover? But what they don't know is that as Italian troops pull out of their positions, crack German units are taking their place. And they're clustered in the one geographic feature that Allied planners worried about. Because while the land around Salerno is flat, it's ringed by mountains, as though the port were a sports field surrounded by grandstands. And that's where the German troops are, moving artillery into position, ready to shell the landing force into disorder before a counterattack pushes it into the sea. Though the danger is not just from the Germans. Amphibious operations are difficult, high-casualty affairs, and the Allies are still new to them. To preserve the element of surprise, it's decided that there will be no preliminary bombardment of Salerno by aircraft or naval ships, and the invasion troops will have to face unreduced defenses. Meanwhile, as the troop ships approach the beach, they hear a German-accented message broadcast from speakers on shore. Come in and give up. We have you covered. They're facing veteran German troops, have lost the element of surprise, and the avalanche the Americans bring will fall on their own heads. Man, Zoe, with so many interpersonal conflicts going on behind the scenes in the Italian campaign, it's no wonder everything didn't go as planned. <coughs> oh, really? Well, thanks to the new Company of Heroes 3, available right this very minute, you're gonna have the chance to put your money where your mouth is. Seriously, this game has all of its bases covered, letting you really play your own way. I mean, for starters, it has not only one, but two different styles of single-player experience you can do. First up, you got your North African operation, which is a really gripping linear experience where you relive some of the most famous battles of the theater, such as Tobruk, El Alamein, and more. 
And on the flip side, you have the Italian Dynamic Campaign, which is a full sandbox-style gameplay experience with an ever-changing campaign map that allows you to command the overall war effort in Italy while also experiencing an unprecedented level of strategic choice in a world and story that actually reacts to your decisions. Oh, and it's also the biggest COH single-player experience to date, by the way. This game is just massive. Then if you want to dip your toe into the multiplayer realm, there are just so many more options. You can play with up to four friends in versus AI co-op, or engage in just blistering PvP combat modes in all flavors from 1v1 to 4v4, and all of them with new mechanics, new factions, and just more units than ever before. And we haven't even talked about all of the other new goodies yet. Stuff like beautiful high-res environments you get to play in, everything from sleepy fishing villages and rolling mountains, to sweeping deserts and oasises. Oasi? Oases. Wait, what's the plural of oasis? doesn't matter. Also, there's deep perfaction tech trees that unlock new game mechanics and just really cool, authentic, layered storytelling that helps deliver more diverse points of view on the conflict than ever before. Also, on a bit of a personal note, because I sometimes get a little overwhelmed while playing RTSs, I'm really excited about a feature they're calling Full Tactical Pausing. That'll basically allow me to engage with their single-player content at my own pace, and I just think that's a wonderful accessibility option that's going to help me and a ton of other people out enjoying this thing. Really great move on the team there. So if all of that sounds up your alley, Company of Heroes 3 is available as of right now, and you can snag a copy for yourself by visiting the link in the description below. What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 